Someone was talking to me about it being Super Bowl Sunday, and you know, Super Bowl Sunday is one of those big events in the United States. Uh, it's second only to the celebration of Christmas in terms of um, how consuming it is in our society, and you know, something over 100 million people are going to watch the game today, and it's going to be exciting, and there's going to be commercials. Four million dollars for a 30-second commercial, that's $133,000 per second. Arnold Schwarzenegger was paid three million dollars for his part in a Budweiser commercial. Uh, and so someone was talking to me about this, and they said, um, are you going to have a good sermon on Super Bowl Sunday? And I thought, I don't usually have a good sermon. What makes you think it's going to change for Super Bowl Sunday? Uh, actually, I didn't say that. I, I, what I said is, well, what's a good sermon? And they said, a short sermon. So I'm going to give you a short sermon. It's a sermon about the devil, sometimes known as Richard Sherman. Um, <clears throat> So it's something about the devil. You know, everything about the devil, everything you hear is true. He's really bad. Um, the devil is, um, well, the embodiment of, e- embodiment of evil. As a matter of fact, if you take the D away from devil, you've got evil, which is kind of cool that even within his name, it tells us what he's like. If you take the E away from evil, you've got vile, which, of course, the devil and all his minions are rather vile. You take the V away from vile, you've got ill, which is what the devil is going to make you. And if you take the I away from ill, you've got L, which is where the devil is going to take you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and may the Broncos win. Um, to the extent that people in our country believe in the devil and they believe in heaven and hell, there is a battle over how to avoid hell. And our society has responded to that battle in a plethora of ways. We have, uh, have a, a, a growing body of people in the United States who simply deny the existence of the devil, and they deny the existence of God. We call them atheists. Uh, we celebrate their day on April 1st. Um, <clears throat> They just say, they say, you know, there's no afterlife. There's no good. There's no evil outside of that which is within ourselves. Uh, they've bought into the humanistic approach, the Darwinian approach, that we are just the top of the food chain. And the only reason we're kind to those who aren't as fit as us is because we've evolved uh, morally. I always kind of wonder about that because if you actually believe in the survival of the fittest, um, why are there still cats? <laughs> um, actually, I think about if you, if you believe in the survival of the fittest, why am I still here? There's a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me and have bigger guns. And, you know, it, anyway, the, the logical response to we're, we are created, we, we began with a big bang and we just go out with a whimper is that there's nothing really there. There's no soul. We're just animals. And what do you do with animals? You eat them. <laughs> Way off the notes. <laughs> Someone said, told me that they were vegetarian, not because they love animals, but they hate vegetables. <laughs> so that's one. <laughs> I keep my day, my day job. You know, one response to the issue of the devil and God is deny the existence of them. And a lot of people in our society are leading that way. There is no devil. There's no heaven. There's no afterlife. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The other responses are what our country has done legally, and that is we've embraced freedom of religion. That is to say that there's lots of different approaches to God. You can believe whatever you want to believe, and many people have now taken it to be more than just freedom of religion, but rather equality of religion. And so we have a great drive in our society towards tolerance. It's not right for you to say that your way is right. 
There is no one way to eternity. There are lots of different ways. It doesn't matter what you believe. You can believe whatever you want, or you don't even have to believe anything. That's how our society has responded to the issue of the afterlife. All roads lead to, lead to nirvana. The only problem is that our society, again, is wrong. Now, most of you came into church this morning understanding that this was a Christian church, and most likely we were going to turn someplace in the Bible. And that means we have at least some respect for the Bible, but I want to talk a little bit about how much respect we ought to have for the Bible, because that is the great difference in our perspective. See, this, our society doesn't have respect for the Bible. Our, our society doesn't believe that the Bible is the Word of God. I'm going to give you three good reasons why you should believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And this is really the first point of the sermon, but it's kind of the, uh, well, it's the first point of the, after the fifth point of, well, you know, it, it's, it sets the foundation. If you don't believe the Bible, then I might as well just tell a lot of jokes, which I do anyway. Um, but if we don't have a confidence that the Bible is the Word of God, then we end up in a position that says there's lots of ways to heaven. It's okay if, as long as you believe something and you believe it sincerely, you're good to go. But the Bible says something different. And so, as a foundation, why do we believe that the Bible is the Word of God? I'd suggest the first reason we believe the Bible is the Word of God is because it's chock full of all sorts of prophecies which have been fulfilled. Prophecies which you cannot manipulate. Prophecies which, frankly, guys like Peter and John weren't smart enough to arrange to happen. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the authors of the Gospels, they couldn't have pulled one over on the people around them, and they couldn't have manipulated this, the things that Jesus fulfilled. For instance, they would have had to find somebody who was born in Bethlehem who was willing to be their stooge. They would, have had find, they would have had to talk to his parents when he was really young and get his parents, his dad, to move him to Egypt so that the prophecy that could, be, could be fulfilled that said that out of Egypt I would bring my son. And also the prophecy would be fulfilled that said that his, he would be born in Bethlehem. And on top of that, they had to get to the king, Herod, and get Herod to say, you know what, we're going to kill all the babies in the area so that there can be weeping and Rama in fulfillment of prophecy. They would have had to get all sorts of different things worked together to fulfill prophecy. For instance, they would have had to get this guy to miraculously clear, uh, heal the sick, to give sight to the blind, and to have a cripple walk. They would have had to convince a, a whole society to, to believe that what they needed to do with this prophet from Nazareth is, oh yeah, they had to also get him to come from Beth, Bethlehem and Nazareth, and they, had to, they also had to get the Roman government to crucify him. Not only that, but they had to get the Roman government to crucify him between two other thieves. And not only that, but they had to convince the Roman government to do something which they don't normally do, and that is not to break his legs when he was on the cross. They would have had to do all these things in order to fulfill just some of the prophecies contained in the Bible. Part of the reason we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and part of the reason we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, is because there are so many prophecies contained in Scripture that Jesus fulfilled. And you know what? You can read all the books and all the libraries and you won't find anyone else that has these many prophecies written thousands of years, hundreds of years earlier that are fulfilled in Jesus Christ, fulfilled in their, pro their prophet, their leader. Jesus is unique in history because he fulfills the prophecies that were given in the Scripture. And part of the reason we believe this is the Word of God is because we keep reading and we're amazed when we see the things that Jesus did in direct fulfill, fulfillment of what was said earlier in the Scripture. I mean, they, to, to think that anybody was smart enough to put together that many fulfilled prophecies, uh, it's kind of kooky. There, there's just too many. So that's the first reason we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, because what it prophesies came true. Second reason we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, let me make sure I got, my, got, got this in the right order, um, is because it's of its consistency. You know, the Bible was written over like 1,500 years, and it contains the same message. The just shall live by faith. That's it. All these writers, all these different guys, getting together, penning the, the Scriptures, by, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's got one message. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. It's an amazing message. That's the third reason. It's the message of the Scripture is so peculiar it's so opposite of humanity. 
You know, if you were going to devise a religion, if I was going to devise a religion, if I, if I wanted to call myself um, the, the great Poobah or something, and I, I wanted you guys to follow me and to uh, place your faith in me, and I give you a, reserve you a place in heaven, you know what one of the first things I'm going to do is? I'm going to figure out a way that I can get your money, your loyalty. I'm going to tell you the things you have to do in order to please God. That's what man-made religion does. It says you have to go through the seven pillars. You have to um, give you two years of missionary work. You have to be willing to strap bombs to your chest and blow yourself up and kill the infidels in order that you can get into heaven and have your 70 virgins. It's going to tell you the things you have to do in order for you to please God. And then along comes Christianity, and Christianity says, you know what? There is nothing you can do, nothing you can do to please God. It's all on God. All you have to do is have faith in Him, faith in His love that He's going to send His Son to save you. The, the, the idea that people are, would come up with this faith-based approach to heaven, it, it, nobody else has it. Oh, and the other thing is that nobody else has this idea that their prophet's going to die, be buried, and rise again. All the prophets and all of the religions are dead, save one. That is Jesus Christ. That's the message of the Bible. And we believe that the Bible is the word of the God because of the, uh, not only those things, but those are three pretty good reasons to believe the Bible is the word of God. Now that brings us ultimately to the Bible and what does the Bible say? All, when we tar, start talking about what, are we going to go to heaven or are we going to go to hell? What does the Bible say? Our society, first of all, says there's lots of different roads. There's lots of different ways to get to heaven. You can be Hindu, you can, Hindu, you can be um, Confucius, you, uh, you can be Buddhist, you can be Mormon, you Jehovah's Witness, you can be anything you want to be, you can be a Muslim, and you can get to heaven because it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe something. And even many people would suggest that even the atheists who do not believe in God at all, they're going to get to heaven because they at least believe strongly that they don't believe. Okay. That ain't what the Bible says. Our society says there's equality of religion. Every religion is on the same footing. The Bible says that's not true. We studied last week a passage beginning in Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, you remember the passage because it was a passage where this guy has been set by the gate called Beautiful. He's been begging there for people to give him something. And Peter and John come, and Peter says, that silver and gold have I not, but what I have I give unto you. And he reached out his hand, pulled him up, and said, walk. And so here's a guy walking into the, into the temple. You remember this, right? I remember because I nearly passed out after this service doing this. So he comes walking in, and there's all the stiff coats in the back. They're going, whoo, I want a refund from the one I gave that guy this morning. And, and, and then the, the whole temple is amazed at what has happened for the man who was sitting by the gate called you beautiful now is walking and dancing, probably even showing his ankle the shame of it all. And then Peter starts talking, and he says, this is Acts chapter 3, he says, you know, this is the story of Jesus. And he goes through Scripture. And he tells the story of Jesus through the Scripture. And it gets him in trouble. So when you get to Acts chapter 4, what's happening is that Peter and John have proclaimed that this man was healed through the name of Jesus Christ, and he gets called before the Sanhedrin. Now, those are the yuckety, muckety yucks of, of Israel. They're the religious leaders. They're the, they're the guys who tell you, you know, you're not doing everything right. And they, he has to come before them and make his defense. And there he is in Acts chapter 4, and this is where our text is for this morning. Acts chapter 4, we're going to begin reading actually with verse, uh, yeah, I'll get it in a second. We're going to be, begin reading with verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of, of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of, the, of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands healed before you. He is the one, the, the stone you builders rejected, who has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Amen. There is Peter and John standing before the Sanhedrin, 70 guys that are all, they're supposed to know it all, but they know nothing because they don't know that Jesus is the way to heaven. 
The reason that we believe as, as, as Christians, the reason we believe that there is one way to heaven is because that's what the Bible says. There is no other way to heaven. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 14, verse 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There is one way to heaven, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. You can't get to heaven by tithing. You can't get to heaven by going to church. You can't get to heaven by marrying the the right person. You can't get to heaven by strapping a bomb to yourself and blowing yourself up in front of a bunch of infidels in the hopes that that will somehow win you into he- a way into heaven. You get to heaven by one way, and that is Jesus Christ. We disagree. We, as biblical Christians, disagree with a society which says all religions are equal. There are not many paths to heaven. There is one path to heaven, and it is through Jesus Christ. That is what we believe. Now, if you came here this morning and you were confused about that, I ask that you simply read the Bible. Don't take my word for it. My word is nothing compared to the words of Scripture. I never would have said it. I would have said salvation is found in tithing. (laughs) I was making a religion. The Bible says salvation is found in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And if you came here today and you do not have faith in Jesus Christ, That's where you have to begin. Go back to the sermon on the devil. Follow him and he'll take you to hell. If you want to avoid hell, you have to turn to Jesus. It's that simple. It's that dramatic. It's that life-changing. You have to come to Jesus. And so if you came here today and you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, this is what I suggest you do right now. Recognize the gospel message. The gospel message is very clear. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God demonstrated his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Whoever believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they shall be saved. It's a, it's a four-step process. Recognizing you're a sinner, recognizing the, the cost of sin, recognizing the price paid by Jesus, and then accepting that gift that God has given to you. You can do it right now. You can just pray right now and say, Heavenly Father, that makes sense. I see what the Bible says. You don't, have to, you don't have to be able to turn to all the passages. You don't have to be turned to the passage that says that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem. You don't have to turn to the passage that says he was going to ride into the, to Jerusalem on a donkey that was unbroken. You don't have to be able to turn to the passage that says he's going to give sight to the blind. You don't have to be able to turn all that. You can just take my word for it now. And if you want to find that out, I'll show you how to do it. But just do this. Come to Jesus. Come to faith in Christ because there is no other way that you can get to heaven except by faith in Jesus Christ. And you can do it right now. One of the reasons we pray that five-second prayer. Because we know that people have to meet Jesus in order to get to heaven. For a lot of us, we've... Now, you've heard this message before. It's Communion Sunday. You're going to hear it again. So what do you do with it? Well, one of the things we do with it is we pray a five-second prayer. By now, you you should have had that five-second prayer memorized. It really isn't that hard. Heavenly Father, please draw Jessica to Jesus and make her an ambassador of Christ. That's That's who's in my bulletin today, Jessica. We have a name in the bulletin for you. you. You ought to have names in your mind about people who need Jesus Christ. And we pray that five-second prayer because we know that no one comes to the Father except through Jesus, and they only come when the Father draws them. And so we ask people, that, God to draw people unto him. So the message that, uh, today, there is salvation in no other name other than Jesus. What do we do with it? First of all, we have to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. And then it's got to move us to something. It's got to move us to to tell people. Nathan's dad called me this week. Couldn't find his 37-year-old son. He wasn't responding to phone calls, text messages. He missed work for two days. Didn't call his own son on his birthday. Very unusual pattern. And at 37 years old, a man who appeared to be perfectly healthy, a man who had gone skiing the week before, a man who many of you met, at 37 years old, his heart blew up. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he met his maker.
What are you going to do to the 37-year-old men and women in your life that don't know Jesus? You've got to tell them about Jesus. It's one of the things we're encouraging you in Living Hope 101. Pray for 100. Give 100. Share Christ with one. And bring him to church. How many of you have ever memorized a verse from Philemon? Philemon is one of those weird books. Because we all, it's in there. And it's kind of a cool, you you've, you've know about Onesimus and all that. You've, it's kind of a cool book to preach from. And I asked in the first service, had anybody memorized any book from, any, any verse from the book of Philemon? And not one person raised their hand. However, and I'm going to embarrass him because I think it's just hilarious. Um, after the service, someone told me that they did. They have a verse from Philemon memorized. Does anybody have the King James Version? Anybody here have the King James Version? Really, nobody has King James? That's too bad. You've you, you got to look this up in the King James Version, but one person, our associate pastor, has Philemon verse 7 memorized in the King James Version. And I don't have it with me, but it says something like this. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the bowels of the saints. <laughs> and that's why he has it memorized, because it, he's refreshed the bowels of the saints. It actually is, is a term for the hearts of the saints. That's what everybody else says. But that's not the verse we're going to look at. There's this other verse in Philemon. It's actually Philemon verse 6, where Paul says this. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. I pray that you will be active in your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. You see, a lot of us came in here today, and when you saw the sermon, title of the sermon, no other name, you thought, ah, he's going to preach from, from Acts chapter 4, verse 12. That's a, well, I understand that. I've been there. I know that. And... He's going to give a good gospel presentation. You know, you want to come on down, come on down and get saved, and we'll, we'll pray for you, and we'll pull the baptism out, we'll baptize you right here. Okay. If you really want to get baptized today, we'll figure it out. It's going to be cold, though, because we don't have that much hot water. Nevertheless, there's something that we need to leave with today. Each of us. Those of us who have heard the gospel message 100,000 times, we need to hear this. If there is only one way to heaven, we need to share that way. We need to tell someone about Jesus. Now, honestly, a lot of you, I think, are, are like me, although not nearly as good looking or have a good sense of humor. Um, a lot of you are like me, uh, <laughs> and you're not nearly as modest as I am. <laughs> When you think about sharing your faith, what's your first motivation for sharing your faith? Yeah, typically, I have two good motivations for sharing my faith. One is, you're going to hell, and you know, I want to get you out of hell, and I'm doing you a favor. You know, I, I, have got, I am just helping you because I am just that nice of a guy. And then I have this other thing, you know, will there be any stars in your crown? You know, it, 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 it's a little notch in the belt. <laughs> got someone to pray with me. All right. And Paul says to Philemon, pray that you will be active in sharing your faith so that you will know the goodness of God. So maybe you're not motivated to share your faith because other people are going to hell. Maybe you really don't think we're going to be wearing belts in heaven so the notches are going to be all gone anyway. But share Jesus. Because in sharing Jesus, you will gain a greater understanding of the goodness of God. An incredible little verse. Better than verse 7. You have to worry about the bowels of the saints. But you worry about sharing Christ actively so that we can know Christ better. There is no other name, there are not many roads. The Bible's path to heaven is clear. It is through Jesus. And the Bible actually makes clear this. 
that the way people hear about Jesus is because of us. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us today to do all that we can to communicate the love of Jesus to a world which needs you. I pray in your name. Amen.